as descendants of savages and cannibals, were ill-prepared for higher civilization, while their pseudoscience eugenics stepped up its racist activities. There is a clear and long and intimate connection between the eugenics movement and the Ku Klux Klan. Harry Laughlin, who was the Carnegie Institution's director of the eugenics record office, had close relationship to the Ku Klux Klan through the publication of a book called White America, which was written by a uh, major Klan leader. So Lachlan wrote a glowing review of the book in the eugenics news. Uh, and at the same time, you have the Ku Klux Klan using eugenics to justify their racist goals. But psychiatric racism wasn't exclusively American. Some of the worst abuses of the 20th century occurred in South Africa, where the government adopted the same racist theories and practices used by Hitler. This was no coincidence. The prime minister had studied eugenics as a psychology student in Nazi-influenced Germany in the 1920s. Dr. Hendrik Verwurst is regarded as the architect of apartheid. Uh, he saw South Africa as a divided state with whites, blacks and brown people living in totally separate areas with uh, black people having no rights whatsoever. With apartheid in place, psychiatrists established mental hospitals throughout the country that were in fact nothing more than slave labor camps. These places operated under a private company by the name of Smith Mitchell and Company. They were saving money through the cheap accommodation for psychiatric patients while making massive fortune out of money that Parliament had appropriated for medication. So it was a corrupt system. When this operation was finally exposed, it was discovered that 67,000 prisoners had perished. While at the same time, psychiatrists had collected $117 million in funding from the South African government. The World Health Organization issued a report declaring that psychiatry cultivated racism and that apartheid did have a parallel in the ownership and trading of slaves. In 1971, in the United States, psychiatrist Louis Jolly West continued psychiatry's legacy of racism, hatching a secret aversion therapy experiment called the Violence Center. His government-funded plan, implant electrodes in the brains of African-American and Hispanic males to shock them should they exhibit any violent behavior. And if that didn't work, chemically castrate them with drugs. When West's racist proposal met with public outrage, the plan was quickly shelved. Though psychiatry's unrelenting racist theories were blunted, they were not stopped. In 1994, psychologist Richard Hernstein co-authored The Bell Curve, claiming to prove that blacks were genetically disabled and therefore inferior to whites. The Bell Curve um really argues a very old eugenics idea. It argues that people are born with different kinds of intellectual abilities, that these are inborn pretty much at birth. It goes back to the notion that somehow black people are genetically and biologically inferior to white people as a way to justify what was really its pro programs of social racism and social sexism. And you see that kind of thinking going on in public school testing and IQ testing and educational testing and tracking. And this new tool fit into that old mold. It was a new tool that could prove the intellectual inferiority of African Americans. Psychiatric profession has done great damage, certainly in the past, and far too many in the present too, to subvert democracy and perpetuate racial stereotypes, even more deep racism in society. We have to battle against this continual uh, misinformation, disinformation, pseudoscience. Uh, it can be repackaged in whatever form or format it is, but if it is based solely upon the color of one's skin and then is the merit of that human being, I just reject it. And so today, the flame of hatred continues to burn, fueled by pseudoscientific lies. This is the heritage of psychiatry, as a justification for racism and as a pretext for political repression.
быть верными коммунистическим идеалам, убежденно, с революционной настойчивостью, притворять в жизнь Ленинский завет, учиться коммунизму, трудиться самоотверженно, по-коммунистически, всей жизнью своей, утверждать на земле дело Ленина, дело партии. Ленемся! The Soviet regime demanded absolute loyalty. Those who did not tow the party line were considered dissidents and labeled enemies of the state. With no more than a whisper to the secret police, they would vanish into one of these special psychiatric hospitals. Despite the risks, these so-called dissidents put their ideas of freedom into action. Я вел жизнь тайную, конспиративную. Никто не знал, что я это делал. У меня была маленькая подпольная типография. И я стал делать листовки. While others considered themselves loyal Soviet citizens. Я, например, считал, то уверенно считал, что я один из лучших советских людей. Когда уже даже... Меня арестовали и, и написали особо опасный государственный присутствие. Я рассмеялся. Я при нем, при этом же сам нынешний мой генеральный, рассмеялся. А он меня вызывает в психиатра на утро. According to Soviet psychiatrists, they all suffered from inflexibility of convictions, a symptom of a new disorder sluggish schizophrenia. Like their counterparts in other countries, the Soviet psychiatrists prescribe powerful drugs to cure their patients. Но они никогда их с удовольствием не принимали. И на кое пути их не принимали. Мы обязаны просмотреть прием лекарств, но прием, чтобы больные лекарства дошли до больного. Вот они где-то, как говорится, в горле проглатывают, все, ротовая полость чистая. И потом вот такие делают какие-то движения, а отрыгивают. Врач на обходе говорит, как себя чувствуете, Петр Петрович? Я говорю, послушайте, вот, а, а там, э, когда э, 5 кубиков галоперидола, то да, например, слюна до полу, там перекошенность вся, значит, одни мышцы растягиваются, другие сокращаются, совершенно ужасные позы, лицо все ужасное, на душе страшно просто. Я человека, вот самое главное, описать, описать это состояние невозможно. Санитары совершенно безнаказанно могли избивать. По любому поводу, или вообще без повода. Вот, например, э, санитар открывает дверь, э, и вот, если, э, тут ты оказался, например, в этом в проеме двери. И вот э, этого достаточно было, чтобы скажем, получить удар. Если э, больной, э, скажем, оказывал сопротивление при избиении, то его могли привязать и привязывали, и уже избивали, и продолжали избивать уже привязанного. Проходит, допустим, год, два, там выписывает убийц, выписывает насильников. Михаил, ты бы лучше убил бы кого-нибудь, мне бы легче было тебя отсюда вытолкнуть. Это было, вот, расстало такое чувство безысходности. From 1967 to 1987, the Soviet government arrested over 2 million people, who for political reasons were diagnosed as mentally sick and were forced to undergo psychiatric treatment. Even today, psychiatry remains the coercive tool of choice for governments throughout the world. What we've learned is that in Getmo or Guantanamo Bay, that we had teams of healthcare professionals called the biscuit teams, behavioral scientists, um, psychologists, working with the military to advise them on how far you could push a, a prisoner. There are abuses that have been documented around the world.